So hello, welcome. Um, Lisa, it's great to be here with you. I'll just do a little introduction. I am Nadia Colburn, and this is part of the Align Your Story interview series, where I talk to writers, activists, visionaries, change makers, who help us come into a more aligned story, both internally and externally. And I'm talking to people who both tell the truth and light the way forward with compassion, courage, and appreciation. So today I'm talking to Lisa. Lisa Marie Rankin is an author, teacher, and Ayurvedic wellness coach. She makes wisdom from ancient traditions accessible so women can improve health, relationships, career, and more. And through her work, she teaches women to reconnect with their bodies, prioritize pleasure, and rely on their inner wisdom so they can feel like a goddess. Rankin is the author of The Goddess Solution, a practical spiritual guide published by HarperCollins it teaches women how to apply goddess wisdom to modern day malaise like sex, money, parenting, divorce, and more. She also teaches a six week online program, the Goddess Solution Masterclass, that teaches women how to step into their feminine power so they can approach life with energy, confidence, and joy. She holds an MBA and MS from Bentley University and lives right outside of Boston with her two children, dog, and rabbit. And in her free time, she enjoys hiking, snorkeling, and spending time with Mother Nature. And you can find more at her website, Lisa Marie Rankin. And I will also put that link uh, in the text. So welcome, Lisa. So good to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here with you too. Um, and we first met in my Align Your Story class, which we'll talk more about that and your journey because I really want to talk about your book and the teaching that you're doing and also um, your journey for how you got here and followed your own inner goddess wisdom. Um, but first I'd like to ask, uh, what is about your childhood? So we kind of get a sense of where you're coming from and what was your childhood like and what do you think in your childhood prepared you for this work that you do today? Um, and it could even be something like, well, it was very different. So I knew I wanted something very different, but what were the seeds planted in your childhood to, that brought you here? Sure, it's interesting. I wish I had a um, a more decisive answer on this, but I'm not really sure what seeds were planted in my childhood. So I came from a pretty unreligious family, an unspiritual family, but yet there was always something that I was interested in. So I remember in high school starting to read and learn more about Buddhism and, you know, getting into yoga after college. And it was, I was always very drawn to it, but I'm not sure where that where that desire or motivation came from because nobody around me was drawn from it that I'm not even sure where I found it but I think sometimes you know when we just ha we have these innate senses that we should be like exploring something or you know there's these things that spark our curiosity and that's really how it was for me yeah that's so interesting and also that you know it's like it might not be in our immediate family, but there's something within us that we then look for and we find um, find responses to in the world around us, which is so interesting then that your book and your teachings are very kind of multicultural, coming from lots of different sources. So you had to look around you to different places that weren't necessarily in the tradition that you grew up in, which sounds like wasn't a very spiritual tradition to kind of like, wait, where can I attach this longing, this knowing, this wisdom that I have within me? And, and then you see them, oh, wow, look, all around the world. Yeah, and that, that is the interesting thing about my book and even with my course and teachings, it really kind of draws from several different traditions, you know, where it's like, but I love how they all come together and they even come together with what we're learning about science or positive psychology, just about the way that humans work and the things that we need to really make us feel better and to make us thrive and be able to connect as a community. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's interesting because we often talk about now, I think, okay, well, what do people need for health? We need a certain amount of diet, sleep, work, relationship, but there's also a spiritual component to what we need for a fully, for most of us, not all of us. Some people kind of maybe don't have this need as strongly, but many of us have a real spiritual need to, to, to be filled, to really feel healthy and aligned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think that's so important too, because that's what a lot of what, you know, I talk to like my students or my coaching clients about, like often when we think of self-care or wellness, we're thinking about what do I need to eat or should I go to bed early or what should I exercise? And, you know, meditation is pretty mainstream, but not necessarily maybe for the reasons meditation was supposed to be made, you know, used for. So it's really like, well, that's one component, but it's also so much more. It is like, it's emotional, it's mental and it's spiritual as well too. So they're all components of like feeling really good and having this sense of self-care. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so let's talk a little bit. So you had a childhood where this wasn't really a piece, but can you look back to your childhood? Did you feel like you had some, when you're connecting to goddess wisdom now, do you feel like in some ways you're reconnecting with a part of your childhood that maybe you didn't have a name for? Does it feel like it's something that's developed? as you've gotten older. I think when I think of goddess wisdom, I kind of think of the early childhood years where it's like, there's just this sense of authenticity and a sense of play and curiosity without having to get to a particular direction. So in some ways, I think like goddess wisdom really goes back to kind of our youth or our playfulness, our creativity and our inspiration. So it's kind of like thinking back to kindergarten when you're just putting kind of paint on something and you don't really know what you're making, but you're just creating. So I feel like it's that energy that then we start to lose throughout our lives. You know, we start to, as we progress in school, you know, it's more about like dates and deadlines and getting good grades. So it becomes like a very more masculine linear process. Mm -hmm. But I really feel like the early childhood years of that creativity, exploration, curiosity is really what I think of as kind of the, the central point to goddess wisdom. Mm. Oh, that's really beautiful and interesting. And those different kinds of energies, right? I mean, you talk about the feminine energy and the masculine energy that we all have both within us. Um, yeah. And, but that feminine energy is often suppressed in our culture. Um, and, you know, even in a monoth theistic religion, then we managed to get a God that is a male God. And what happens to all that women, you know, women's energy, because in um, non-monotheistic religions, there's always like women goddesses. So, um, but, but that, that female energy is, is less linear and one more flow. I know you talk a lot about um, Saraswati. Am I pronouncing that name correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your own journey into this state of you kind of had a linear path for yourself and then you got off of it and that was part of um, reclaiming a state of flow for yourself, reclaiming your own goddess energy. So yeah, could you tell us a little bit about that and, and whatever goddesses inspired you along the way? Sure. Yeah. It's interesting because I think I probably followed the most linear path. Like if there was a playbook for, you know, what women should do in like Western culture. I feel like I probably followed it. You know, I went to a four-year college. I moved to New York City about the day after I graduated. I was working in technology with the dot-com boom for five years. Then I came back to Boston, the Boston area after five years. And I met someone, got married at 29, had two kids by 33, and like was working my way up the corporate ladder. And I always say like, that sounds just like very, you know, so cookie cutter of what it is that we would think that one should do. But then it was really in my mid thirties that I started to kind of feel like I was just going along to get along, or it's like, I was just kind of playing out the script that I didn't write. Like everything just started to seem kind of very unintentional. I mean, yeah, like I was just kind of, I was doing things because they were laid out before me, but not necessarily because they were conscious decisions, you know, and it's mm -hmm. just, so a lot of things started to change during that time. Like my marriage was very rocky and it was really going downhill. You know, I was find, finding work very uninspiring. And I remember really at that time too, kind of searching outside of myself for things that would make me feel better, whether it was, you know, having a couple of cocktails every night after work or, you know, a glass of wine every night or, you know, really focusing on my appearance. And then once my husband and I got divorced, so, you know, really focusing on, am I, you know, the next date or something? Like, who am I going to date to fill that hole? And I think at one point I was like, you know, I really don't feel like a goddess. It's like all my energy was going outward, it seems like. And it was interesting because even though I've always been interested in spirituality and yoga, I hadn't really spent that much time thinking about goddesses. But kind of when I said those words to myself, I was like, well, it lit something else. But I'm like, well, what 
what a goddess feel like, you know, and I really started to do research and it was like, in a sense, it was almost like this feeling of like coming home or uncovering, I mean, this tome of wisdom, even though I know it's, it's been out there forever, but it was uncovering it for me. But like, there's like a sense of sovereignty where I shouldn't be looking outside that, you know, I kind of, I'm already whole and, you know, it's not about getting ahead in the corporate world or getting all of these external markers for success, but really kind of just finding joy and passion and inspiration in my own life. So that's really kind of what got me on more of the goddess path. And then I was so excited once I was learning it, I started, it was like, I'm going to start sharing this. And, you know, I created a blog on Medium that was really well received. And I think it's just a different way for women to frame the situations in their lives and also get different perspectives. And, you know, these myths really act as like a roadmap. Yeah. And what I love about working with myths is even though they're thousands of years old from different cultures and traditions and religions, you know, they're all, you can see their commonalities like across, whether it's like South America to India to Greece. And that's because even though we're separated by geography, we share this common humanity. Like we want to find that our lives have meaning. We want our children to be safe. We want to ha have love in our life. So they really give us this great framework for, you know, how we can approach the different situations in our life. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so I think one thing is that often people feel like, well, I'm on this path. So how do I, how do I trust that inner voice within me? Like if I look inward, I'm going to get cut off. And so where, where was it in that path that I think you were taking a line in your story and I'm sure you were doing lots of other things, but um, I think you were just beginning to in this, in the middle of this, right? Like transitioning out of your corporate life, getting a divorce, how, how did that course and how did that time, like what were the markers that allowed you to do that inner, inner work instead of all that outer work? I think, and I think that, I think you said it, it's really kind of trusting that inner voice. And I think we've been taught not to trust it. You know, we try to reason or think our way through things like that's not practical to start like, you know, take a writing workshop right now, or that's not practical to leave such a well-paying job. And you know, it depends on how you define practical, you know, if like your intent is just to, you know, make a lot of money and make sure that you have this big nest egg, you know, maybe it's not, but I, I believe that there is no destination and it's really about the journey. And if we're not learning, growing and doing things that like are interesting to us, then we're kind of missing the point. So I think actually I was still working in the corporate world and I'm not even sure where I found Align Your Story. I really have no idea where I had even... Mm -hmm found it. I might have been at, we did a workshop once at um, a Kundalini, you were teaching a workshop and maybe it was there. I just don't know which one came first. Um, it could have, wow. but I was, I think it was really that sense of like, well, I've always wanted to write and like, why, why am I not writing? So that was kind of the first thing that got me back into like, I can do different things that are kind of start coloring outside the lines of, you know, what my life is supposed to be. Yeah, I love that because you hadn't been writing and then it was like this little voice saying, okay, it's time for something different. Let me look inward. Let me do this work. Let me listen. What is that wisdom that wants to come out? And you just took the next step. Okay, I'm going to go to this workshop. Maybe it was a yoga workshop. Okay, then I'm going to go to this writing workshop. Haven't written for a while, but I'm going to try it. And then it was just like, okay, just keep on one step in front of the other, do that work. And then you started writing your blog. And I remember then I taught a class, uh, I think it was at Grub Street about mm -hmm. how to put a book together. And I think that you told me that was when you kind of outlined um, The Goddess Solution, which is a beautiful book. Oh, thank you. It's right there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is when I was outlining and it was um, shortly after I started my my blog on Medium and I was like, oh, what would this, you know, and I saw that you were teaching at Grub Street. So I'm like, oh, this will be fun. Let me do this. And it's interesting because I outlined it. So I feel like I set it out in the universe, but then I never really did anything with it. And I mean, part of it was, you know, against we have that inner critic, like, oh, this is such a long shot. Like, I'm not going to be able to write a book like, you know, self-publishing seems really hard and I can't, you know, and I don't know if it's you know, a real publisher would like want to publish it. So I kind of just sat on it for a while. And then I was contacted by Harper Collins a couple of months later, like, would you be interested in writing a book? And I had the kind of the draft, the proposal almost ready to go. So of course I was like, yes, I would love that. 
Yeah, it's such a beautiful just story of just taking one step and trusting and kind of saying, I'm going to step into this. I haven't written much before, but I feel like it's time for me to be doing something new. And then the steps just, okay, I'm going to outline a book proposal, see what happens. And then it was there. So kind of putting those intentions into the universe and aligning with yourself for what you wanted to do. Because I think so often people feel like they need to, I need to know if I take this step, where is it going to lead me? You know, if I go inward, then I'm going to be cut off from the rest of the world or it's not practical. But your story is such a beautiful example of that when we listen inwardly, it creates those other connections with those around us and with the world. Just kind of, again, going back to Saraswati, kind of that wisdom of listening to the flow. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of doing the things that light you up. So those like little voices of like, whether it's like, I want to learn how to make sushi or I want to, you know, travel to, you know, South America, it's like those, that's kind of like the divine talking to us. And a lot of times we brush it aside because we're saying like, oh, well, that doesn't make sense right now, or I'm too busy with my children or work is too busy. But when we're saying like, oh, I don't feel inspired. I think it's because we're not listening a lot of times because we have these ideas, we have these creative impulses, but a lot of times we just kind of push them aside because it's not the right time or it doesn't seem practical. So for me, connecting to the divine really is following that. But it, it is taking a leap too, right? Because, you know, you decide to travel to South America for a month and you're leaving your job. Yeah, you might not get the money. You know, there, there's there's pros and you just have to decide what's what's more important to you. Is it about, you know, are you trying to get this final destination or is it just about the journey? Right. And, and you don't necessarily know what the final destination is, right? Exactly. You know, yeah. so that, yeah, maybe you don't want to leave it all at once. You want to have some kind of safety net. But, to, but I really like what you said about listening, because I mean, obviously, as you know, I talk a lot about deep listening. And I think there are different vocabularies, right? In kind of more Buddhist tradition, it's deep listening. But in a different tradition, it could be like, Turning, tuning into your unconscious or you talk about like when you talk about goddess wisdom what is the goddess is it a higher power is it something within ourself is it an energy is it an emotion it could be interpreted in lots of different ways but I think however we interpret it it's it's a matter of paying attention right paying attention to something in a different way with a different level of curiosity trust um, interest right and not right. just, as you said, like brushing it under the rug. Yeah, it, it's um, it, Joseph Campbell in The Power of Myth. So he's, um, for your audience, the author, educator, mythologist. You know, he was often talking to people about following their bliss. And he had a really beautiful quote. I can't remember what it is at top of my head. But like, once you start following your bliss, you put yourself on a track where you're living the life that you were meant to live and doors start to open. And it's not something that we've been encouraged to do, or at least I wasn't. It was more like, okay, you go to school, you get a job that pays well, and there's no bliss involved in that. <laughs> it's like, these are the things that you do. But I do feel that like, once you start doing that, it, it doesn't become work anymore. Like, I honestly, like, it's hard for me to go to sleep sometimes because I'm so excited to get up in the morning and like start writing or start creating a new curriculum for a workshop that I'm giving. And it's really just, it's a completely different energy. It's more of that Saraswati being in that flow low state right and do you associate that goddess wisdom with more pleasure I mean I think that's something you also write about and I think for many women um, and men also of course and I think men also need to tap into this energy but <laughs> um but pleasure is such a loaded topic and um so to release that pleasure state um there's a wonderful book by Rain Eisler about just um the like transformative power of pleasure. Um, it's like, it's very radical. And, and, and what, what goddesses kind of help you with that? I know, cause each, each kind of part of your book has a different category and then different goddesses and stories about the goddesses. 
Sure. That's um would be for me that would be goddess Hathor. So she's an Egyptian goddess. So they describe Hathor. She spent her days dancing, listening to music, eating fine foods, hanging with her girlfriends, and like making love. So she was really called the goddess of delights. But she was also like an advocate for women, for like their spirituality, for their health. She was there whenever they beautified themselves. And I really love looking to Hathor because it says like pleasure should be part of our spiritual practice. You know, I think sometimes we're in a very like no pain no gain society or like pleasure is selfish but I mean we're humans we can experience pleasure you know and the things that when we start to notice too the things that we desire that gives us a sense of like where where we want to go or you know that gives us the energy that we need to approach life yeah and I think so often in our culture actually desire has been kind of co-opted so that we don't even know what we authentically desire you know and we have this consumerism capitalist blah 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 culture but you know advertisements oh what you really want is you want this car or you want this power or right like but do we really want it you know so again it's a matter of deep listening what do we really want and tapping into our body not just our head right like because so often that straight line of this is the path forward is very head centered it so, is yeah. yeah. And I, I often um, like work with some of my students on that. And I did a workshop over New Year's. It's like kind of getting into starting to get more curious about why you want things like so say you want like, you know, this fancy new car. And it's like, well, why? Why do you want it? Like, do you think you'll look good in it? Or do you think, you know, does it will make you feel important? Or is it going to help you get to your daughter's college fast? You're like, and keep going deeper and deeper until you get to the root cause. And, you know, usually the root is that like, we either want to be respected, we want to find love. And we think that these are the different ways that, you know, can get us that get us, whether it's the respect or the love or the attention that we're seeking. But yeah, it's interesting to start going deeper. Like, and I found even in the corporate world, I remember getting passed up for this promotion that I was pretty certain was mine. And all of a sudden it just went to somebody else. And I remember being really like upset about it, but it wasn't because like, at this point I kind of had half my, you know, half my foot out the door anyways, but I just felt like, I felt like kind of like marginalized and it was just, it was more about my ego. Cause I didn't, you know, like, I didn't even know if I wanted to be in the corporate world, never mind the promotion, but I remember being upset, but really getting curious about it. And it was more like, well, I want people to think that I'm like growing with the company or I want people to think that I'm smart, less about me doing the work for that would be required right. in the promotion, but it was more of how this promotion would have, have me per be perceived. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very profound, right? It's like, just keep on asking those questions and going deeper and deeper and, okay, is this about me and them or is it about me and me? Yeah. You know, if I, and, and I am a um, admirer of Byron Katie who kind of turns things around with questions and then always says, you know, well, if you want, you know, if, if you want the car because you want respect, then, why don't you just give yourself the respect that you want? You know, like, what is it that we're not giving ourselves that we're looking for the external world to give us? Yeah. So I think that tapping into that, you know, goddess wisdom is giving us permission to tap into that inner um, wisdom, right? That inner strength, that inner capacity to give ourselves what we really most desire. Yeah. And I think that's important. And it's also important too, that we don't judge it. Like, so if we want the fancy car, cause we think it's going to make us more popular and get a cool, like, I mean, I think be honest with yourself, you know, we're humans. We all have, you know, these different needs and just, I mean, you're only going to be able to get to the root if you're actually honest with yourself. So instead of kind of then shaming yourself and making up excuses why you want the fancy car, just be honest, you know, and you can still get the car too, if you want, you know, but just get clear about why you want it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's not like an asceticism, right? Like at the root yeah. of it, you just sit in your mat all alone. No, it's like these stories that you're telling and the book is populated with stories which is also really lovely um is you know big big adventures big stories of transformation of action of dancing of having sex of you know having beautiful clothes of, of having adventures that go awry and then need to be remedied remedied and you know that it's not a matter of just kind of like sitting and not doing anything but really living 
Right. And I love that too, because, you know, and I, I find that in my own life too, where sometimes, you know, cause I have two kids, a dog, you know, a big dog that likes to get walked a lot and stuff. And if in the morning, if I'm like, you know, feeling really harried, I'm like, oh, I didn't get to meditate today. And it's like, you remember, it's like life is our practice. Like, yes, we, you know, sitting on our cushion and doing our meditations or our mantras and our gratitude, like, but that prepares us for the kids and for the dog and for the work and everything. It's really all of our practice. So it's kind of, you know, more of that tantric perspective where it's like our life is our spiritual practice too. And I think that really is what I get out of the goddess wisdom as well too. It's like, you know, mother, ma, like we're here in the material realm. And this is, this is what we're working with. This is kind of like our, you know, our ingredients in our cauldron, just our everyday experiences. Yeah. And do you find that um, really focusing on the feminine there and what was that decision? I mean, because you could have had a decision to write, you know, um, everyday spiritual stories you know why why focus on goddesses why focus on women um and I you know people ask me also with align your story why is this a class for women you know and so I always say well you know I I, I want to share with men I believe in sharing with men we all have the feminine the masculine within us but there's also something that gets overlooked if we don't give some attention and energy to the feminine so I'd love to kind of hear your path and what that's been like for you and why you made that decision. Sure. Well, I feel like so much of our culture is very like dominated by masculine energy. And, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with masculine energy. As you pointed out, we need both, you know, it's just, um, but so much is what we've learned, like the educational system, the corporate system, just anything that's kind of our political system. It's all kind of very masculine that I feel like we have enough of that right now. So I really kind of wanted to focus just on a more feminine approach, which is just a different approach to living. And it's not the only approach. Like I truly believe we need both to get along successfully in the world. But for me, and I also thought from a spiritual perspective, like so much of the spiritual teachings are, you know, about talking about the men's spiritual leaders. I mean, I know that there's some with women, but also just to give another perspective or another, another way of living and engaging with the world. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I also find that having groups of just women, as wonderful as it is to have, I have some groups with, you know, that are co-ed and those are wonderful, but something a little bit different happens when, when, when you just have women together, there's like another barrier goes down a different level of truth telling, of safety, um, of kind of sisterhood that happens, I find. It is. And it's really beautiful. So I've like run some book clubs and I actually have one coming up now with women who run with the wolves and I have monthly goddess circles and these are all for women. And it is just really amazing when women get to connect and it's of all ages from like, you know, 24 to like 74 and, you know, people from all different demographics and like really coming together to consider how these concepts of played out in their own lives or, you know, how they want to grow and evolve. And it's really special. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because a lot of the women have also confessed. And I've also felt that, that their relationships with women haven't always been so easy that, you know, a lot of them will be like, oh, I've always preferred to hang around, you know, men because, you know, the typical sighting, less drama or just felt more comfortable. But yet, like when we can start to come together again, I feel like we start to heal some of that like sister wound. We really start to tap into our feminine power as well. when we realize that we are, we're friend and not photo one another. Yes. That's beautifully said also, because there's often a lot of tension (laughs) between women. Yeah. And that, that tension also, I mean, as you know, I think you do in your book beautifully and all of these stories do, these aren't easy stories. There's usually something to be overcome, right? There, the darkness goes with the light and we have to, um, we can't get to our authentic bliss by just bypassing the things that are difficult. And I think with all of these stories in the book and that you're teaching, it's like embracing what's hard, you know, not pushing it aside and moving through it and having these stories of goddesses or, you know, whatever it is that remind us that we can, we can make hard transitions. Yeah. And so, So your own journey, right? I mean, it sounds like it was not so hard, but still a brave transition to say, you know what? I was on this one path and I'm going to go off and do something else. I'm going to trust. I'm going to listen. I'm going to tune in and I'm going to create something, which is also that creative energy. Yeah, it is. And I mean, it's still, and it's, 
it's never like, oh, you get to the other side. I mean, I still have a daily voice daily. Like, you sure you should have left your job? Like, you sure? Like, don't you miss all of that money that you used to get into your account? Every, you know, and there's always going to be like kind of that inner critic or that sense of self-doubt, but it's really aligning with your higher self and what it is that you want, what it is that you want to create. So it's not like the doubt ever goes away. At least I don't believe that it does. It's like, we just get a little bit more skilled at not listening to it or aligning with, you know, our more of our values as opposed to that critic or the more egoic voice. So if you have a just mindful of time, um, are there any, actually, is there maybe, I always like to ask people, is there a section that you might want to read aloud to us? Oh, sure. I didn't consider that. I have um, my book right here. Let's see if I have uh... asked you that in advance, but I, I forgot, but it would be great to hear a little bit. Sure. I think um I think I'm gonna read the very first part actually, because I think that kind of taps into like that goddess energy that I was talking about as we opened the call. Is yeah, that okay? That's great. Yeah, maybe just like a few paragraphs would be, you know, fantastic. Sure. So I was born a goddess. I squealed with laughter when I was happy and I wept without shame when I was sad. I gave my love freely and expected to receive love in return. I was wild, messy, and curious. I didn't care how I looked. I was attuned to how I felt. Even though some things took effort, I persevered. I didn't care about perfectly accomplishing a task to impress others. I wanted to develop skills. As a child, my daily objectives were to pursue pleasure, give and receive love, and acquire knowledge. Later, I learned that these are the same daily objectives of living like a goddess. As I grew older, I began to change. I came to believe that I needed to look a certain way and act a certain way to be lovable. I learned to suppress my needs for the benefit of others, and I was careful not to make anyone angry. I hid my frustrations in favor of being agreeable. I no longer prioritized play and pleasure. Instead, I focused on getting ahead, first in school and then in the corporate world. But getting ahead just meant achieving society's standard of success, not looking within myself to recognize the unique contribution I can make to the world or identifying the things that lit me up. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And so if you had um, just some advice for someone who's like, okay. And I also think it's really interesting that this turn to going back to your goddess wisdom, to doing the things that light you up can happen at any stage of life. As you said, you can be 24, you can be 74. So wherever one is on one's journey, what steps would you say people might take to just listen more deeply and, and trust and, and follow through on, you know, what they want to be doing. Sure. So one of the steps I often, um, you know, say feminine spirituality begins in the body. And I think that that's kind of a good place to start is like, really starting to treat yourself like a goddess. And like, what does that mean? And it means like, you know, getting a good night's sleep, making time to meditate in the morning, eating nourishing foods, and kind of tapping into that divine mother energy. So, you know, we're never too old where we don't need enough sleep, nutritious food, and to move our body in strengthening ways. And I know people, sometimes we all want to skip to the spirituality part, right? And it's just like, well, we can't really access that if we feel crummy, if we feel tired, if our nervous system is activated. So to me, it's like really tapping into divine mother and you can think of Gaia or Demeter and stuff like how, how would you mother yourself and just starting to feel safe and strong is I think the first way to start tapping into that goddess energy that's very wise and you know it's exactly for that reason that I bring the body into my teaching for writers yeah. because we can't align if we don't listen to the body the body is the root right so we start in or in a kundalini yoga class which is the yoga that I share um, it starts with that root chakra, getting grounded, getting safe, getting embodied, and then we can express and take the next steps from those places. So that was a beautiful, beautiful response. Um, yeah, I think it's just so, so important because, yeah, we all want to skip to the crown chakra, right? We're, we're right. Like, <laughs> but it, it really starts, yeah, at, at the root, as you say. So I think that that's really one of the first steps is taking care of yourself and getting into that divine mother energy and then listening to those creative voices. Like, do I want to start writing? Like, and, you know, if I'm nervous, like, what am I nervous about? Like, that the writing is not going to be any good. And like, 
why do I care if the writing's not any, you know, again, going deeper and like getting rid of that inner critic and starting to just trust those little ideas that you get into life, whether you want to take writing or again, like learn how to cook something new or go on a trip, but just trusting that there's something there. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of kind of squashing it, really let it flourish, you know, like this is a divine spark within us. It's a yeah. divine calling to be yeah. creative, to, to listen to ourselves, to tune in and to connect. And that when we tune inward, we're not cutting ourselves off, but rather connecting with a whole, you know, world of traditions and energies. So. Yeah. And it's really beautiful. So to yeah. do that. And again, yeah. And I guess this kind of goes with it, but again, enjoy yourself, like pursue pleasure, like whether that's like making sure you get out for a hike or taking a warm bath, of course, strengthening pleasures, like not drinking two bottles of wine or going out to Vegas and blowing your money. I always say it's like the pleasures that you're still going to feel good about tomorrow, but making yeah. sure that you're kind of engaging yeah. in those types of pleasures. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, again, I'm going to just show this book to everyone and you can yeah. put a link in, in the, um, text area. And then also I like to end the conversation with three questions. So the first question is, is there a book or a piece of music or a movie or a walk or hike that you've been, is there something that you've been really enjoying recently that you want to share with the audience? Um, Cause I just like to share the love. Sure. So one book that um, I've been enjoying lately is Carolyn Miss Intimate Conversations with the Divine. So in it is really, it's like a book of prayers. And what I love about it is because I feel like at least for me, like thinking of prayer, you know, you kind of picture hands clasped, like kneeling by your bed, but she really talks about just having a conversation with your higher power, letting them know your hair. And I really love the way that she kind of has all of these prayers, almost like talking to a good friend. And I think that that's just a great practice to get into. And it's whoever your higher power is, and it could be your own inner wisdom, but starting that dialogue. So you feel connected throughout the day. That's great. Thank you. And that actually leads me to my next question, which is about a practice. Um, we've talked a lot about different practices, but is there a specific practice that you do regularly that you want to share with people just as like, this is a fun practice. It could be the one from the Carolyn Miss book or something else. Like. Sure. One of my favorite practices is an Ayurvedic self-care practice, Abhyanga, which is the practice of putting warm oil all over your body. So it could be coconut oil, sunflower oil, sesame oil, and I'm sure, you know, countless others as well. And that's just a great practice. And again, as I just said, like, I think the first step to tapping into your goddess is coming back into your body. It's kind of like, a practice where you're reminding yourself you're like a sacred being and it's really caring for yourself. And if you live in a colder climate, like we do, or like a cold, dry climate right now, it's just it's really nourishing. So I think that that can be really a beautiful practice. That's something I try to do a couple of times a week. Sounds yummy. Um, and then my final question is a question we talk a lot about um, listening inward and that kind of how that connects us. But I'm interested in, are there things that you do more explicitly to connect with others outside of your small circle? So things that help affect structural change, political change, global change in any way. Is there anything that, that you could share with us that you do? Sure. So I have um, a six week online program. It really goes deeper into the concepts of my book called the Goddess Solution Masterclass. And I give 10% of the revenue. So I have done to Care India because because that's when they were really struggling with COVID this summer. And I also do the American Himalayan Foundation, the Stop Girl Trafficking Program. And the reason I've picked those foundations is because a lot of the wisdom and a lot of the practice, the yoga and Ayurvedic practices, they're from those traditions. So it's also my way of giving, you know, giving back as well too. So that's something that I'm going to continue to keep doing because I think it's a great way to honor where we're getting all of this incredible wisdom and helping, helping the people there. That's great. I just really always like to remind people that the self work we do has incredible ripple effects. Um, and I'm sure in so many ways, doing this work has helped so many women, has helped your children, has helped people when you just walk down the street and smile at them, um, have, have people listening to this interview. Um, so showing up for your bliss is really a radical act to, to spread it with others and to um, change the world just a little bit. So thank you so much for sharing your time and thank your you. goddess wisdom. And it's really wonderful to be here with you. Yeah, it was wonderful. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Okay.